Hey guys. Well, I can't flip my hair because I cut it myself this morning uh, in a very uneven fashion before I came to work at six in the morning. So possibly not the best haircut ever. Um, today's lesson of the day. It used to be called Wednesday's lesson of the day, but now we are Thursday consult days and life has been wonderful since. The today's theme was people asking what's different about the way you do a facelift or asking really like what is the aura lift and my answer to them was that the aura lift is my gimmicky name for a vertical vector modified extended deep plane facelift which is the type of facelift that i do and we give it procedures these names to make it seem kind of unique and special or to say hey we do something different that's really the only reason there's no other reason why uh, the question is though what kind of lift it is and where did the name aura lift come from so the name aura lift uh, was actually made up by a patient and then Natalie who used to work for us realized that this patient came in and she said you know I don't even feel like I had a surgery I don't feel like I had a procedure I feel like you just lifted my aura and that was uh, when I was thinking about like a list of names amongst the top. When I think of anything, I uh, try to create something new. I make hundreds and hundreds of options and names. And if you ever see my logo, like I sketched 50 logos before I chose, oh, there you go, that logo. So I sketched this when I was in fellowship, sitting there one day, just trying to figure out and I had like 50 other ones. So the aura lift came from that. Now, what it is, is a vertical vector. All lifts are vertical vector the word lift goes that way. So that's obvious. Uh, vertical vector modified extended deep plane facelift, which means it is a type of deep plane. So what is the deep plane? Most surgeons don't fully understand this and you will be shocked to hear that and you'd think that they would, but most surgeons don't fully understand this. So the deep plane, hi Rob Cohen. Yeah. Hello. The deep plane is easy to understand if you just grab your face. So grab your face and then clench your teeth. So if you clench your teeth, You'll see that there's a muscle underneath you guys can try that and everything you're grabbing up here is skin and muscle and skin and smash skin and muscle skin and smash and you see that it moves and it glides over that deeper muscle called the masseter that's called the deep plane and it's a very special plane because it is a glide plane for most of the face and if you play with your face you'll see that oh my god that is the plane that your face actually descends in the most now you do get some deflational changes over time. People's bones can change a little bit over time. It's, but the bone is like the most minimal of contributions to facial aging. Um, so surgeons usually talk about the bone a lot because they get failures in their lifts and they think that it's because they didn't address the bone properly, which is kind of irrelevant for the most part. Uh, but this is the deep plane. And when we want to lift the face more naturally, we want to lift it in the plane that it aged in, and that's the deep plane. It's not really the deepest plane, it's just the middle plane. We call it a deep plane because it's deeper than the shitty facelifts that used to be done that were under the skin. So that's why we call it a deeper version of that, the deep plane. It is not deep in the face relatively, it's actually right in the middle. If you play with your forehead and you go back and forth, you can see that it also glides over the bone or over the periosteum. That is also the deep plane. Here you have the frontalis muscle, here you have temporoparietal fascia, and you could kind of pull it off. You'll see skin and temporoparietal fascia come together, skin and frontalis come together. That is the same as the skin and the platysma here, or the skin and the smas here. That is all one layer. So the skin and the muscle are together, and you want to release them from each other as little as possible. So what you try to do is just manipulate that plane that you're already gliding in, because that's where everything came down, and you try to reset it. That's why the deep plane is so fantastic, is because it is the most natural plane to lift in. It's the plane that you age in the most. It's the easiest to manipulate. So surgery doesn't take 10 hours to do a facelift. It takes like two hours to do a facelift. It takes like 20 minutes to do an endoscopic style brow lift where you're manipulating the deep plane. And the lip you have it too, although it's not a glide plane over there. It's the smass on top of the muscle and you can manipulate it, roll it, and move it over. Now, how do you get this deep plane to mobilize is the tough part for most people. If you see there's a glide plane on most of the face, but if you get to certain areas here, you see it's really dense and tethered and you can't pull this off because it's the platysma and skin are stuck down to the parotid gland. And if you do it over here, you'll see the same thing right under the corner here. It can't pull off as much as it does here. You see that's loose, whereas right here it's adherent. That's because your skin and your platysma stuck to your parotid gland. If you see this is mobile, 
that's mobile. But if you really try to move along this line, which is where your chondroitin tendon is, this line right here, the superior temporal line, you'll see it's kind of stuck here. So that's your conjoint tendon. In order to mobilize this guy and that guy together, you gotta release this guy. That's your conjoint tendon. And you release it all the way back over here and that allows your brow to go back. For the face, you release the platysma off of the parotid gland all the way over here. And then you can easily spread the other parts because it's muscle over muscle and they have to move independently. So it's easy to release that part. Over here, you come over the muscle, you just release all the smass off of it. You connect it to this plane, everything moves up, and you don't have to choose the vector. So all the papers that determine how much angle to take this way, that way, 45 degrees, 60 degrees, 70 degrees, are largely irrelevant, other than just telling you the general guideline of where most people go in case you are completely off. It just helps you kind of know the general direction, but you can't apply that to any given person. When you lift, you will take them in the direction that they move the most. And if you go this way, you'll see there's some pleating. If you go that way, you'll see there's some pleating. But if you go this way, there's going to be no pleating. And that's the same with the brow. Now, the interesting thing about the brow lift to understand is that most people lift it in the wrong direction. And this is the majority of surgeons in the world. And it's because brow aging isn't described uh, accurately and neither is lifting. So the uh, biggest mistake that I see with brow lifting and why patients are scared of it is because there's usually a bit of a surprised look. Where does a surprised look come from? Lift up your eyebrows. What's the direction of surprise? It's that way, right? So what happens if you lift in the same exact direction? What happens? It's gonna look surprised. It is the direction of the emotion for surprise is up. So if you don't want someone to look surprised, don't lift them up. So then how do you get a lift? Lift and up might be a little bit different because we're not going directly vertical. If you grab your head and you move it back, you'll see that the medial brow and the lateral brow all correct when you go along the superior temporal line over here. So you can grab your palm and you can move it and you'll see that the medial brow moves about 45 degrees outwards in this direction and that is medial brow ptosis medial brow lift, medial brow ptosis, medial brow lift. It went that way along the superior temporal line. It does not go this way. Surprise, bigger space here, not sexy. So it goes that way. And the cool thing about brow lifting is that it's not important how much it actually vertically lifts. What's important is you've developed redundancy in the forehead and scalp pushing down on the brow over time. This is what happens. So you re develop redundancy as it comes down and people's eyebrows are strongest medial to that conjoint tendon. So I told you guys the conjoint tendon is there. Your frontalis muscle is the strongest in that two centimeter or two finger span breadth, just medial to that. It's weak over here, you can see it drops. So there's not that much strength in the middle. And if you look over here, there's zero strength. There's no frontalis muscle there. So what happens as this crowding occurs over time, your eyebrows start to compensate. And as you can see, it goes up in an arc. So people's brows start to change in this shape over time because of that. The depressors here, pull it down. The depressors here, pull it down. And the elevators here, pull it up to compensate. So you start to get that shape over time. If you take the weight off of the brow by moving the scalp back to where it was, you relieve all that stress and their brow, which was doing this, straightens out again from that to that. That's the magic of doing a proper brow lift. So. There are tons and tons of papers discussing the proper brow shape, discussing from the side of the nose going through the canthus, laterally should be the peak or the arc of the brow, lateral limbus, lateral, whatever. There are all these papers that are largely irrelevant. It is hard to uh, get people to understand that because it's been repeated so many times that there's a proper brow shape or a proper arc or things like that, that they don't realize that this parroting of saying the same thing over and over and over again doesn't mean that something is actually true. The only reason to change someone's brow shape is if they were ugly to begin with and you didn't like their brows when they were young and you don't like them now. However, most patients are not getting a brow lift for that. They're getting it because their brows have drooped over time and the shape starts to change because of the strain on the brow. So rather than focus on how to change the shape, focus on getting rid of the strain. Go in that deep plane, you release it, you move it back to where it wants to go. And again, if you pull it this way, you get bunching. If you pull it that way, you get bunching. If you go this way, 
you get no bunching. And that's how you know that you're in the right direction. And the deep plane allows you to do that because everything is released and it resets appropriately. So a proper brow lift, what does it actually look like? Physically, it's like this. And it goes to that. Physically, it could be like that. And it goes to that. It looks more relaxed. That's what a brow lift looks like or should look like. Now, Trevor Gretzky is probably the best example of a good looking brow. And if you guys ever want, you can look him up. Um, he's a handsome man and he has probably the best looking brow I've ever seen. As far as the face goes, same idea. Now, the cool thing about doing a deep plane between the face and the brow is that if you do them together, you end up getting a better overall movement because you get an offloading effect and then you get a preloading effect by moving this off and the entire face starts to function a little bit better when you don't have as much strain and gravity in it. Most of what we're fighting is gravity related. And if you lay somebody on their back, they look better. This is uh, why, that's gonna make a sex joke. I gave this in a lecture and it was probably inappropriate, but either way, uh, you always look better when you're laying on your back. Um, this is why uh, also people tend to over resect or cause cobra neck deformities. So a cobra neck deformity is if you've seen people who have been operated, they have fullness laterally, fullness laterally, hollow in the middle. Uh, the reason this occurs during surgery is believed to happen because of over resection of the midline or because of a dehiscence where the muscle breaks apart in the midline. That is not the case. It is because it happens mostly just because of resection in the midline, not over resection, any resection in the midline. The reason for that is if you sit somebody up, these two things drop down. If you lay them back, those pop back into the neck and this stays the same. So when you're laying down, you think that the lateral part is flat, but it's not, you're being fooled because they're laying down. And what that means is you don't wanna go reducing things in the midline without reducing things laterally. This is a whole nother topic, but coincidentally it's just went there because I talked about laying on your back, which is again, more of a sexual thing that I was gonna talk about, but let's not. Um, so that is that. That's our deep plane lesson of the day. If you understand this, what I'm talking about, you will understand and be able to explain deep plane better than 99% of surgeons in the world. They have other ways of explaining it and it's convoluted and unnecessarily convoluted. And you now know the simplest and most accurate and correct way to understand the deep plane and manipulate the deep plane and why we age more in the deep plane and why we wanna lift in the deep plane. So I think you understand that all now and I hope everybody has the best Thursday ever and I hope Trevor Gretzky will one day be related to me somehow.